Well, hi, everybody. Let me say Happy New Year for the last time. Uh, we said it last week, but I'd love to say it again this week. And, uh, you know, what can we say after the first week of 2020? Well, there's a great deal. But, you know, the Bible says with many words, there's often much sin. And so I think it's always much better to pray. Um, so let me call even for a time of prayer in your home. Maybe you want to call up a friend. If you live alone, why not just call up somebody and have a word of prayer? Pray for blessing on our church, on your own life. Pray for blessing for our nation. Why not? Not, uh, fathers, mothers, lead a prayer time with your family, even this very day that you're listening to this broadcast, and just uh, bring your request before the Lord. Let me, in fact, pray for us together at the start of this year. Heavenly Father, you truly are our treasure. Lord, you are everything to the believer. Apart from you, we can do nothing, Lord. In fact, we are nothing without you. But we thank you that with you, we have the fountain of life. We thank you that we have hope. We have direction. We have your presence. We thank you, Lord, that as we go through the valley of the shadow, your presence is with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. We thank you, Lord, that you prepare a table for us. We thank you, Lord, that you anoint us with the Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that your goodness is all around us this day. And we pray, Lord, that many will dwell in your house forever, even as a result of this message today. And so, Father, we do come before you and just say as a church that we need you. Uh, each one listening in, Father God, needs your help and your touch today. And so we pray, Lord, that you'll draw near to us. And we say this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey friends, we got a new series starting next week that's a major series. We're calling it Heaven is in Sight. And I want us to enter into some of the struggle that Bible characters were going through just as we go through struggle as well, but also to be encouraged that heaven is in sight. It's not like the ultimate series saying everything we can about heaven. I'll mention some of the great books that do that for us. But of course, the Bible is the greatest book and it continually gives us glimpses of our future in eternity. So I believe that's going to help us greatly. In fact, there's a connection with this current series. It's just the two-part series, and this is the second part today. So you can always look back on what we said last week, but we're talking about true treasure today. And I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 25. We've got it on screen as well. Matthew 25. Matthew 25 has three parables. I'll talk about that later, but this is one parable in particular that we're looking at today. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And I thought I would just pause there and say, you know, uh, we, we do get tired, we do get weary, and in one sense, we're waiting a long time for the Lord to come. It will also be in the twinkling of an eye. Life is long, we get tired, we get discouraged, but this is an important message for us about readiness and the certainty of the Lord's coming. Verse 6, at midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for us both and you, for, sorry, for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. And I want to pause on that word and say, you cannot receive spiritual readiness by proxy. You can't receive spiritual blessing on behalf simply of somebody else. You need to believe for the Lord yourself. You need to obey the Lord yourself. You cannot delegate your obedience to someone else. You have to be ready yourself. Verse 10, while they were on their way to buy the oil, those are the foolish virgins, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others also came, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, and these are some of the most painful words in scripture, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, so what's the point of this parable? Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. 
You know, friends, this is usually a vision day. Well, how does one cast vision in a pandemic? In a pandemic after a dreadful year of division in the land and a debilitating beginning to the new year, we feel the stress. We know many people who are sick. There is pain and sin on all sides. Well, we need hope and we need to know what we can do as a next step. I've often heard it said that Elizabeth Elliot used to say always, do the next thing. When you're in crisis, just do the next thing, the thing that is right to do. Now, we always need a challenge, but I'll tell you something, we also need comfort as well in these days. And I believe that a right vision will encourage us when we're on the right path, when we're on the right road, there's encouragement that goes with that. True vision energizes us and sustains us. So how do we share a word today that encourages and sustains and comforts and unites, but at the same time guides and directs and empowers us. Well, I've got a picture here to show you. We call it the upper room and the lower room. We've been coached as a team on the, this thought for a, a few years now, our upper room identity and our lower room identity. I want us just to think about that for the moment. In the age of attraction, which was in vogue perhaps until very recently, a local church could operate very easily at a ground floor level where we come to church, we connect with church, we serve in the church, we may even tithe to the church, especially because we love the place and the personality or personalities or the programs or the people. And so we kind of connect on that level without going to that upper room of being a sold out disciple of Jesus Christ, um, of knowing God's unique call for our life and for the vision of a local church and to be obedient to the, we call it the vision frame that God has given us. But sometimes we just get stuck on the place. And so if there's any change to any of those things that we don't like, if the place doesn't keep up to speed or if the place um, changes or somebody else has a better place or the personality we don't like or they leave or someone else has a better personality, you can see this ends up being a very frail connection and vision has little to do with our connection in church. And so what happens when those changes take place very often, instead of following through on our commitment to being a church member, we find ourselves kind of getting taken away from that. Now, the alternative to that negative view is that we have a vision of being a disciple. Think about the disciples being in the upper room. Think about that time when the Holy Spirit came upon them. When we're a disciple of Jesus Christ, when we exalt God, when we understand the purpose of the church, there becomes a deep abiding connection that is not affected by the temporary changes that take place in our world. And, and just at this moment, here I am, I'm giving, delivering this message from the North Campus. I'm especially thinking of those when I first came uh, here who uh, would sit not far away from me who became my heroes because they'd been here for not just one, two or three generations, even four generations of belonging and commitment and service to the local church. Clearly, you can stay in a church a long time and you only ever connect to the place or the personality, the program, the people. But generally speaking, those that endure with a sweet spirit and become effective, they've got the upper room vision in their heart. And so I just wanna share that with you. What is it that sustains a pastor? 70% of pastors have thought of quitting in 2020. Tarshish has never been more appealing if you know the story of Jonah. Let's find an easier life. But what wakes me up in the morning, what um, gives me the, the desire to risk involvement and forward momentum at the deepest level? Well, it's an upper room vision. It's Jesus Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. My life is not my own. That's what sustains me. It's an upper room vision. Big picture for the church, but also specifically for this church as well. And I believe that's true of our leaders and just so, so many of our members who I'm so thankful to uh, because during 2020 and now into 2021, you have endured and you've seen personality, place, program, all those things kind of, uh, some of them taken from us when our programs, our natural discipleship rhythms almost disappeared for a while and all we could do was connect online. Gosh, it's been a challenging time, but if you get the vision, then we endure through those things. Hey, can I say something about this country? 
I love this country. We give ourselves to service here. We give the best years of our life here. We're raising our family here. We became citizens. That's a story in itself. But let me tell you something. When my country is in a mess, with me also, it hurts. I'm embarrassed. I've got a bunch of friends that's like, what's going on over there? It is embarrassing and it hurts. We traveled far to get here. We left a lot behind to get here. But I'm telling you, we love this country. But it does not ruin my joy when we're in a mess because heaven is my home. We'll talk about that in the next series. And my joy is not robbed because not only is heaven my home, but God has given me a purpose and us a purpose in all the challenges. Very often we can say our mess is our message. The Messiah came to the mess. I'm hopeful because of God. And I'm, I'm hopeful because there are many of us in the upper room. Spurgeon would say that if a soul does not become regenerate, eventually the world will take hold of that so-called profession of faith and drag them away. We truly need to be born again and renewed. And we need to make sure that we're strong in the Lord during these days. And so our church over the years has cast vision and has expected, to do God, expected God to do great things even in challenging times. Uh, round about the time of 9-11, uh, the church was declaring boldly that we expect to supernaturally impact our community, nation, and world. By the way, it's not us doing it, but God supernaturally impacting our community, nation, and world. Then we went through an era where we tried to really simplify and say, hey, we're about declaring the gospel, we're about discipling, and we're about doing God's word. Declare, disciple, do was a phrase that we used for many, many years. From 2017, we've been using the phrase, and again, it's God that does the transforming, not us, transforming lives, families, and communities. That kind of identifies where we minister, lives, families, and communities through the revived people of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful thing that God wants to work through us. And we've got our values. You can go to our website and look, look at our mission. And uh, we declare the five E's. And this is a simple way of thinking about church. We elevate prayer, worship, and the word. That's the elevation. That's our connection with the Lord. We expect many to respond to Christ even in a pandemic. We enable each person and family to grow. And you've been hearing about our family huddle the last week or two. I'm really excited about the flexibility that our leadership is showing in enabling each person and family to grow. We want to equip each one to contribute. I'll tell you a bit more about who, me later. And we encourage biblical community. You know, the devil is trying to ruin the church of Jesus Christ in our land and across the world, but we're committed to community and we're committed for that community to be biblical rooted in the word of God. All this is part of being a disciple. These are timeless truths that are pandemic proof. But undoubtedly, these are, these are challenging times. I was talking to Thomas Hammond the other day, who's head of the Georgia Baptist Mission Board. He shared with me that 70% of Georgia don't go to church even on one day. The environment around us has changed. And so we have to go to the upper room. We can't just survive in the lower room. We need to understand the vision that scripture gives us of what it is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, heaven is our home. But it's also about what God can do through new hope as well. And so we've got a number of stories this year, and I'll be unpacking the passage in a moment, don't worry. Uh, we've had a number of stories this year that take us to the upper room of ministry. We've determined that a change of circumstances in 2020 did not mean the end of ministry. So for instance, our catering team kept their oil in their lamps and went from serving food on campus to preparing the food on campus and then creating a driving team to personally serve many, many senior adults every week. And I know this has been a huge blessing to many senior adults. I've received many encouragements from our senior adults who know that their church loves them very much. Our services, you know, went from how we used to do things. In fact, only 15 months ago, we had three services. We had the North and the South Campus. We had our Spanish ministry. Of course, we added the Northgate Campus. And since then, two more services that have been added. And we need to especially support those that are doing so much more on the service. And by the way, that's the second service at the South Campus and the online service as you're counting up all six. 
Our music and media team came up with Fear Not, which has been an outstanding presentation. I believe more than 34,000 people have seen that. And newhope.news is a great way of really being able to simply uh, connect. You know, if in doubt, just go to newhope.news, go to the respond tab, and you can usually find some way of connecting with somebody. Then our young people, some of our our young leaders, uh, shared some teaching with me. We did Advent. And by the way, you might have thought it was a very long Advent because it went into January. We did Advent plus the 12 days of Christmas as well, because we had so much content to share with you. And then the North Campus has had services outside, and we can't wait to get outside when some warmer weather comes back to us as well. But can I pause on that second service at the South Campus, and I've shared this with the South Campus and and encouraged them a few times. Essentially, when we realized we had that many people wanting to come back, that it wouldn't be kind of within the uh, recommended limits Um, of of, uh, social distancing, we realized that we had to start a second service, but it's like, well, who wants to go to a different service when your friends are going to this service? You see, from a lower room, a ground floor level perspective, no one would want to do that because I love the place, I love the people, I love the personality, I love the program, it fits. But what Pastor Ellis did, he did a wonderful job, and his family group leaders have been outstanding. Um, And if you're listening in on the second service right now, I want to give you applause, and you can even applaud yourselves right now, but wherever you are, you just applaud um, uh, the the South Campus second service. Ellis took everyone to the upper room and said, this is why we're doing it. It's not just about our comfort. Uh, There will be a blessing for us along the way. And so, of course, the the South Campus second service, because people get the vision, that's growing really fast as well, even during these days. And so I'm so thankful, church, that we're not just operating on the ground floor level, but we're learning to to, to understand what the vision is and why we do it. And it's all really about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's all because the regeneration has taken place in our life. We're heaven bound. We're securing God's love. And so therefore we can obey him and we'll do whatever the Lord wants us to do. Now, I believe that's also important with our unity as well. Let me share this important verse. This takes us to the upper room of biblical community. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. I appeal to you, Brothers and sisters, says Paul, to a church that was a bit of a mess, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say. Got a responsibility to maintain the quality of the upper room, as it were. Agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united. I believe this. Christ has accomplished this on the cross. The Holy Spirit has given given us to this. We must be perfectly united in mind and thought. That's our responsibility. You know, the Bible tells us a lot of ways how we should function as a community. If we hear something, how we deal with that. If someone says something, how we deal with that. We've got to be biblical all the way. We need the power of God. We need the power of the gospel. We need the unity of the body. And, uh, and so therefore, I want to en- encourage you in a, in a little bit more about some of these things. Um, Because of the upper room, because we're called to be disciples, we're going to encourage you to be as faithful as you can be in 2020 with one of those six services each week. We're going to encourage you to be a servant if you can be. And if it's right for you to be staying home for the time being, we bless you. We love you. Uh, You're not a second-class citizen. You're one with us. I know so many of you have stayed really engaged in lots of other ways as well. We bless you. We've also got 20 life classes, and you can do them uh, online uh, throughout the week, not just on a Wednesday night, but throughout the week. It's almost like on demand, as it were. And I've got to mention Humi one more time. We had our biggest and I think most exciting class we'd ever had um, just a couple of months ago, and we're doing another one. January the 25th, I'm going to invite you to to my home with Louise via Zoom on on Monday, January the 25th. We're going to do four weeks, and it's so important that we understand our passion. It's so important that we're consecrated to discover our call and be obedient to it. This will be a refresher course for some. It's another way of connecting to the upper room of the church and understanding what the church's vision as well. And I believe that God's going to really use this one. Again, I'm expecting a tremendous crowd. I want you to sign up for that and and, and, uh, join with us. You'll be hearing from our team about how you can do that. But I'm sure that uh, if you go to newhopebc.news, you can find your way there as well. Can I give one scripture about this as well? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 5, For in him you have been been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all kinds of knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift 
as you eagerly await for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. It's very easy to focus on all the things that we don't have, but do you know something? This word says, God has given the local church all the spiritual gifts that we need. So we need to unleash them. It's not just about program, place, personality, but it's also about the vision of how God can use every one of us. And so we're gonna go who me crazy over the next few weeks. I'm gonna encourage the whole church to go a little who me crazy and dig deep uh, into this. We're gonna get outside as often as we can in 2021. And uh, when we have Christ as our true treasure, we really are in the upper room when we have Christ as our true treasure. Okay, let's focus in the, con I share all that in the context of the urgency that Matthew 25 gives us. And I do exposit the second of the parables in Who Me. So I'll be doing that actually on January the 25th. But there are three parables of the kingdom in Matthew 25. Let's just look at the scripture together. And I would say this about all three of these parables. First of all, all have representation of the Lord himself. It's very important to realize that our service is about the Lord. Church is all about the Lord. Your life is all about the Lord. And so in these three parables, we have the bridegroom in the parable of the 10 virgins. Secondly, we have the master in the parable of the talents. And thirdly, we have the son of man in the parable of the sheep and the goats. So all of these are representations of the Lord himself. And so the Lord is present in your story and in my story. Next, all of these parables have a real sense of urgency. You cannot read Matthew 25 without feeling challenged. Your life and my life really does matter. Let there be a sense of urgency. I don't mean a sense of, um, of um, being freaked out or, or worried. We should have the peace of the Lord in our service, but always in our service, it's very important what we do. Then I would say all of these parables, and you'll notice there are the five uh, foolish virg virgins in the parable we've looked at, but all three of these parables have individuals in each parable kind of missing the boat, as it were, getting it wrong, being too late. It really is possible uh, to be disobedient to the Lord. And that's a really terrible place to be in. Next, all the parables have those that, however, get it right. If you, as it were, they get on the boat. They make it in time. They are ready. They live a true life with faith that is genuine. That's true of the parable of the, the bags of gold or of the stewards. It's true of the parable of the sheep and the goats. And it's true, of course, here in the parable of the ten virgins as well. And then all the parables, as we set the context for the parable we're looking at, all the parables show reward or judgment. Again, our service, our life, everything we do really does matter. So now let's zoom in on the parable of the 10 virgins. And I'm, I'm going to give you, in a sense, a, a top 10 of how we get into the upper room. A top 10 of what it means to be a sold out follower of Jesus Christ. Something that we can learn from this parable. First of all, there needs to be purity amongst God's church. I want us to notice that it's called the parable of the 10 virgins. That word is very plain. We don't often use that word like we used to word. We use that word at Christmas time. Maybe we're almost embarrassed about the word, but it's a, a good word. It's how God creates woman. And so the church and the uh, the church is the bride and Christ is the bridegroom. The church must be pure and ready always for the Lord. There needs to be purity among God's people. And even that very word virginity symbolizes all of it, but that's a very specific point that that should be something that is prized in the church of Jesus Christ. Secondly, among the professing here, amongst the 10 virgins, and that's true of all the parables here, among the professing were wise and foolish. And so sometimes somebody will get angry. Well, why does the church do this? And why does that person in the church say that or do that? Remember that wheat and tares grow together. There are wise and foolish even among us. When the seed is sown, some falls on hard ground, some falls where the soil is thin, some falls among thorns, and some falls among that which is going to bear a great deal of fruit. And so we need to just kind of understand that there are some that never get past lower floor, lower ground living. Among the professing were the wise and the foolish. May we be wise. Next, can we see that there's always a remnant. While they are not ready, there are actually five ready souls. This is a really important theme in Scripture. It's one of the great themes, in fact, of Scripture, that the remnant means kind of those who are left over, the faithful ones who stay there. Isaiah talks about the stump 
And sometimes it's just a few. Many are on a broad road that leads to destruction, but a few take the narrow road that leads to life. God can do a great deal with the remnant. And certainly this has been a time of purging in the church across the world. Verse 4, the wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. Verse 4, the wise ones, however, took oil in their jars along with with the lamps. Not everyone makes it to the upper room. Not everyone is filled with the Holy Spirit. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And then fourthly, the Lord gives us time, but his coming is close. The Lord is graciously allowing us just a little longer to be able to stay on this earth so that we can obey him and fulfill our life purpose. But I'll tell you something, his coming is close as well. And so some were becoming drowsy. And I encourage you, my fellow brother or sister, don't be drowsy. Even as you're listening online right now, don't get drowsy. Don't be apathetic. Um, don't be afraid of, of all that's going on in this world. Rather, find the peace of the Lord and be obedient to him today. So we must be ready. Surely this is a call for us to be ready to serve, for the vision that God gives us to join in wholeheartedly with what God wants us to do. The foolish were exposed as having no oil. In this testing time, in this very strange time when it almost feels like the devil is getting the victory, he does not have the victory, but there are days we get discouraged. It's very important for us to be ready. Imagine a soldier who gets woken up at the night his weapon is not ready. The uniform is scattered all over the place. He's not ready for combat. Uh, it's the same when a Christian doesn't seek the Lord. When a Christian goes around with unconfessed sin, falling out with people and not getting reconciled, uh, creating mayhem in the body of Christ as Paul tries to minister to the Corinthians, he challenges them about that. We need to make sure that we are ready. And so preparation is required. The wise virgins, those five wise virgins, clearly were prepared. They had enough oil. They weren't being mean or selfish to say, we can't share our oil with you. The simple fact is that uh, you cannot share the Holy Spirit with somebody. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and they need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't give them your Holy Spirit. You, can, uh, you, you have to be obedient to what God has for each one of us. So therefore, we cannot borrow obedience from somebody else. We have to be obedient to the Lord. And this is usually a series, last week and this week, when we talk about our stewardship. And I would say we thank God for every generous gift that we receive. But I, I think one of the most beautiful things is when all God's people participate. And in 2021, I'm calling upon the church to be faithful with our tithes, to be faithful with our offerings. And I believe this will release us to be able to see what God will do as we reemerge. And perhaps as the world opens out in due course, there could be this pent up demand to serve, to share Christ. I believe that we'll see many people baptized. I believe that we're gonna have some very encouraging days along the way. No, they replied, there not be, may not be enough for us both and you. Well, we cannot borrow obedience from somebody else. The bridegroom will arrive on time. I think we've already kind of said that, but let me tell you, when Jesus comes back, the argument is over. Christ is coming soon. Be ready for him. Don't be sleeping. Don't be without oil. Christ is coming soon. And there are many who try to mock the faith. Satan probably thinks, ha, huh, I've got Christianity vanquished in America, vanquished in Britain, vanquished in Asia. It's the end of the church. Let's punish the church. Let's have believers to be pun uh, persecuted. Get that angry Indian mob to attack the pastor and his family. The secularist declares that postmodernism has all the answers, but I'm telling you, my friend, it's a dead end street because the Lord is going to come back and he will claim his bride. He will claim his church. The remnant will, will be rejoicing. Those with, uh, who were obedient with what the Lord gave them will be given even more blessing along the way as well. The true church of Jesus Christ will be vindicated. All those who have held Christ as our true intercessor, all those pure virgins with oil in their hearts, as it were, filled with the Spirit, all those who are obedient to the Lord will have the joy of meeting the Lord. There is a greater prize. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. The bride will be re reunited with the bridegroom. And so true treasure is found in a relationship with the bridegroom. 
True treasure is found in my relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. And so I want to ask you, my friend, how's your relationship with the Lord? Please don't let church just be like the place or the personality or the programs, the people that, that we connect with. Let it be bigger than that. Let it be Christ in us, the hope of glory. Let it be Jesus in everything, the hope of glory, the hope of everything. Let it be that we are ready for the conquering king, that we trust God, that we're obedient to him. We know that uh, there are going to be some challenging times ahead. But the Bible tells us that when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. This parable shows us our need for readiness. It shows us that we need to be stewards and that means every part of our lives. If Christ is our true treasure, then the tithe is a joy. In fact, it's like, Lord, show me what I can do. Our time, it's not about, hmm, this is my time. We want to serve the Lord. In fact, you know something I was thinking about this? We can invest $19.99 every month or $39.99 every month for our eating habits, for that app that really helps us do something that's beneficial for us. I'm going to ask you to really think about investing in your spiritual life, investing in your family's life, investing in service, investing in our community that we can serve God. Go to the upper room. I'm going to encourage you to do that. I'm going to encourage you to do my Who Me class. I'd love there to be more than 100 people next time. I think it's going to be awesome. Let me encourage you just to keep an eye on your financial commitment, that you're being faithful to the Lord. But the most important thing I need to ask you is, are you ready for the coming of Christ? Perhaps this is the year. It's going to be a surprise. It'll come like a thief in the night. In fact, it'll come at a time when all the prophets are saying it's not going to happen. And yet the Lord will come. And there'll be two in the field and one will be taken away. And two will be walking along the road and one will be taken away. Husband and wife will lie in bed and perhaps both will go to heaven, but there'll be may, maybe some situations where one will be taken and one will be left behind. Make sure that you're ready. And the way that we're ready is to put our trust in Jesus Christ, to be a disciple of Christ, to receive that regeneration. And I'd love to pray that prayer with you right now. Pray this with me. Dear Lord, I need to be a new person. Lord, I get blown about by all that's going on in this world. Lord, I get discouraged. And Lord, I need your peace. So I'm asking you, Jesus, to come into my life. I repent of my sin. I put my trust in you, Jesus, who died on the cross and rose again. And I'm asking you, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Regenerate my life. Adopt me into the family of God. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, I'd love you to go to newhopebc.news, go to the respond tab. Let us know that you prayed that prayer. If you need someone to pray for you, I promise you our prayer team are very diligent on this. You just ask for prayer as well, and they will pray for you. And let me just pray for the church one more time. Lord, I took a little longer this week going over a few things about church life, expositing your word. We pray, Lord, that everything that's been shared today will go deep into our hearts. Lord, as we come to the end of this service, I pray that somehow this will be a spur for us to be like those five wise young ladies, Lord, who uh, had oil and were ready and obedient. Oh God, help us to be ready for what's ahead. May the peace of the Lord be upon us all. We ask this in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen.